half as long as it's not high elevation. I prefer hot field work over cold field work. Oh, sorry. Did Zach put out a recycling today? Is there recycling out? <laughs> the most impractical rock hammer ever. Hi, uh, thank you all for coming again for our uh, September meeting. Uh, several announcements, I'm gonna start a little bit early. Uh, um, before I get started, do we have any guests uh, visiting us today? Yeah, hey, hi Chris. Y'all want to introduce yourselves? You want to say hi? Just. I'm Hannah. I work with Chris on the grant. Um, I'm a research director. Great. Welcome. Are you a member? You should be one. <laughs> Welcome, Greg. Excellent. Great. You guys going to Indy? Indianapolis for the GSA meeting? Oh, great. Oh, great. Chris got an NSF grant to work with students and uh, community college students and go to different places and kind of including these great meetings. So, um, great. Thanks, Chris. So, uh, any new members or we have uh, we have Elliot here. Yeah, well, great. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and you're you're uh, replacing Craig, who just retired, right? Craig Morgan, our past one of our past presidents. So, um, Earth Science Week is coming up, and they are actively seeking volunteers. Um, if you are unaware of Earth Science Week, uh, it's something we hold here. Our uh, outreach group at the UGS puts it on, and um, they. It's always nice to have different uh, volunteers come in and work with all the school groups and kids that uh, come through to learn about Earth Science, and we have a whole bunch of little. Booths and activities to do with the kids, gold panning. Uh, I don't think we have any gold in it, but there's pyrite. <laughs> and uh, we have a stream table. Yeah, fool's gold. So all kinds of, and then dinosaur, and I think there's a rock talk. Um, so if, if you're interested, and I highly recommend it, I'll, do, I'm, I'm, I'll be doing it. Uh, contact Jim Davis, jmdavis at utah.gov. 
uh, he will help figure out what your schedule can allow for. So, also worth noting, uh, there's a John Wesley Powell uh, event coming up at the National History Museum of Utah up there on the um, in the foothills on September the 22nd, and they are uh, honoring the upcoming. I think it's 150th anniversary of the John Wesley Powell Colorado River exploration, the epic journey down the Colorado, mapping the geology and exploring the American West. Uh, <clears throat> U of U is putting on a lecture um, by Arlo Weil, I think his name is, on orogenic processes on September the 17th. Uh, so and they, they put on a number of uh, guest lectures and stuff, it's, it's worth keeping your eyes on, on their um, lecture schedule because they have a number of good people speaking there. And then there's an upcoming AEG meeting this week on the 13th. Is anybody here with AEG? No? Uh, they have Dr. Uh, Rigby coming in to talk and he's going to be talking about munitions some type or another. I'm sure it's related to geology, though. Um, so they're they're definitely worth. And then uh, one more thing on September the 29th, Brian McInerney is going to be talking about climate science at the downtown library. And he he came here and did a talk. I think earlier this year, it was pretty good uh, on climate. He he works for the U.S. Weather Service, so his talks are usually pretty good. Great. Uh, as a reminder, I did put out a little bag for recycling your cans. If you can do that, please. Um, we usually have a bigger container, but we don't this time. Any, any other announcements that I'm missing? Oh, Adam, uh, could you talk about your uh, short course, your Bonneville? Oh, uh, hopefully your inbox is going to email from you, but not too many. Uh, the Lake Bonneville Geology Conference is short course. Up and running, we're going to schedule for October 3rd and 6th. The first few days will be a um, geologic conference. Probably have 35, 30 people somewhere there. I think it's not. I'll be here in the next few months. I'm Jack Lewis. We'll do a talk. You know, we'll do something special and get in there with it on the second day. We have that uh, short course on the UGS main page. Yeah, oh, great. There's, there's flyers on the table. That's great. Thanks, Adam. OK, uh, I'd like to, uh, our, oh, go ahead. Oh, did, I'm trying to make it this Friday. And, uh, we, we had a lot of golfers that mom would play with the tennis and the injuries. And we're looking for um, to give out prizes to the golfers. If you want to prize, anybody want to donate any prizes to the company? Oh, great. I meant to mention that. I thank you for reminding me. Um, yeah, the golf tournament this uh, this coming up, and it's it's benefited the uh, this organization quite a bit in the past. We take turns hosting it between the various geologic organizations here. Who's hosting it this year? Um, uh, the mining engineers are hosting it this year. Next year we're supposed to we're supposed to host it. We had such a poor turnout. Oh man. 
So I maybe I should pick up golf. I don't. <laughs> you don't really have to know how to golf. Just drop the course. <laughs> but but the proceeds go to benefit you know our nonprofit and students, of course. So it's definitely a worthwhile endeavor. And we usually get pretty good sponsorship support. Um, so if you're interested in being a sponsor or a golfer in the future, just keep in mind that's something we do every year. Usually we raise like. Uh, Thousand dollars. Uh, just, just to you, the whole whole pond is like seven thousand. We get two thousand. Thanks for that helping out. Yeah. Yeah, we may be flush with cash this year because of the uh, because of the recent meeting, but it's it's definitely important. It's uh, something that the board has discussed quite a bit is making sure we maintain uh, a balance between our our scholarship and what we're giving away and and um, what we're bringing in. So that's an important source of income for the UGA. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Dennis Newell. Uh, he is the uh, head of the isotope lab up at USU, my alma mater. And uh, his his wife, uh, Alexa Alt, actually spoke earlier this year. So and that, that whole family uh, presenting here. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of New Mexico. Um, he researches uh, CO2 rich crustal fluids. He did his postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab. And now, now he's a uh, professor here at uh, USU. Did I leave anything out, Dennis? No, that's good. Great. Thank you. Oh, this is for our online followers. <laughs> This is like the test to get this thing on. All right, well, thanks for inviting me, um, I guess, down here and feeding me lunch. It's a pleasure to come talk to you. And I'm glad I'm not following my wife, Alexis, right away because she usually gives really good talks. And mine will, will not be as good as hers, I'm sure. Um, so what I'd like to do today is talk to you about um, Great Salt Lake microbialites, which a number of folks in here, I'm sure, um, have worked on, looked at, thought about. And this is, this is you know, a new, you know, a new you know, research avenue for me. This, is, this was not exactly my specialist special, uh, specialization. I came here in 2013 from New Mexico, where I'd worked at Los Alamos National Lab for a while. Um, and I was doing experimental geochemistry on things like CO2 sequestration, um, unconventional oil, um, stuff like that, nuclear waste. Um, but I got involved in this project. I'll talk a little bit about how that happened. And it's been, it's been really interesting because I've met a number of folks, including uh, Mike Vandenberg in the back. Um, I've learned a lot about this system from him. And then a new faculty member at um, Weber State, if you haven't had her come give a talk, that might be really interesting. And she's an expert on microbialites. So uh, I've sort of jumped into this. Um, at first, I was, I was mentoring an undergraduate student, a really excellent undergraduate student, Jordan Jensen, who's now um, going to be starting with ExxonMobil this next year. Um, he needed a senior thesis project, was interested in geochemistry and isotopes. And because the lake level had dropped so much, um, these were exposed and it, it opened up an opportunity to look at them. Okay, next slide. Cool. All right, so a little bit more about me. As, as it was mentioned, um, I'm the director of the uh, Utah State um, University Stable Isotope Lab, a lab that's pictured down here that's been growing over the last um, five years or so. And what am I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geologist, first by training, and a geochemist. And during my, my doctorate work, I really specialized in stable isotope geochemistry. But I am, I am a geologist. And so all of the work that I do is pretty much founded in some sort of field work initially. And as he mentioned, I'm interested in crustal fluids. So here's my recent field season this last summer in, in Peru, in the Altiplano, where this is a bubbling hot spring. And I'm interested in the isotope geochemistry of those gases to give me the provenance 
of the volatiles like the carbon where it's coming from and so that theme takes me into really looking at stuff at great salt lake too water rock biosphere interactions really trying to understand using isotope geochemistry what is going on in these geologic systems that we we observe and then just a, a plug for the lab i know you've got excellent facilities here in salt lake city but we're also a growing and um, we have more of a, maybe a personal touch um, in terms of um, if you have work that you want to do in the lab, you can contact me and I'll work with you pretty closely on getting stuff done. We can do oxygen, carbon, and, and, and um, hydrogen stabilized isotope ratios in water, um, oxygen, carbon, and, and all variety of carbonates. Um, we can do carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen in organic matter, including we have some work on tree rings that we're doing. I have a whole bunch of biologists that come in and want to do various bits of fish, you know, fish brains, fish scales, all kinds of things. And I'm also developing some techniques to look at hydrogen and hydrous minerals, such as like muscovite or biotite that might be growing, say, in a fault zone, or you have it in a xenolith that's transited from the mantle to the crust. So anyway, that's, that's kind of what I do. Um, I'm an assistant professor. Hopefully, um, next time you see me, I'll be an associate professor. So, all right, next slide. Okay, so back to what I'm talking about today. So, you know, due to the historically low water levels, you know, these microbial deposits were exposed all around Great Salt Lake. And this is a photo um, at uh, Buffalo Point on Antelope Island. And again, how I got involved in this is I had a, an excellent undergrad student looking for a project. And there are a number of folks in our department of geology who are interested in a variety of things at Great Salt Lake. And I'm, you know, kind of new, poking around, and they're like, well, you know, the lake is, is really low, and we know these deposits are, are exposed. You know, maybe there's something interesting about those. You know, people look at these in the marine systems, et cetera, et cetera. So I started doing some research on what, you know, what exactly is a microbialite. I mean, I know what a stromatolite is, but I really, you know, this was kind of new to me, brand new to me, to understand what, what we could learn from these. And it turns out that you can learn quite a lot from them. And it rolled right into the kind of things that I'm interested in. Basically, using some sort of geological record that we can access today to say something about, you know, the processes and the water chemistry that were responsible for their formation. And this has led into all kinds of new questions and unknowns and whatnot. Thanks. Okay, so this is not good. These next couple of slides are going to be completely review for most people in this room. There are a few students, so you know it's a good good teaching opportunity for me. Um, put us in a little perspective of where we're at. Again, I'm going to be talking about microbialites in Great Salt Lake, and of course, Great Salt Lake we is really you know I guess we'll call it. I get beat up sometimes. You know, use the word like remnant of Lake Bonneville or a relic of Lake Bonneville. Great Salt Lake is really in the, the cycle of big and small lakes that have happened throughout the, you know, the Pleistocene. We have these pluvial or glacial periods that are wet, and we have large lakes all throughout the Great Basin, filling in these, you know, these low-lying flat areas. And then due to climatic shifts, you know, these shrink, and we get these smaller, isolated, hypersaline lakes um, throughout. And this is just the latest cycle that, that we're, we're sampling here. Next slide. And then, of course, the associated hydrograph. Um, I will say, and I've, I've learned a lot about this hydrograph, and there's, there's lots and lots of data that goes into this. A lot of it is you know, sort of geologic and geomorphic you know, observations in the field that are coupled with a whole variety of geochronological techniques, I mean, a lot of, a lot of radiocarbon dates. And this, this part of the hydrograph is fairly well pinned with a lot of radiocarbon date. There's, not that there isn't any uncertainty into it, but you know we can say from you know 30,000 years ago till about you know 17 and a half, you know Lake Bonneville with some fluctuations has was generally growing and becoming larger and larger. And then of course there's the you know catastrophic Bonneville flood out of the north end of the valley that I live in, which is an interesting story in itself, dropping things down to the the Provo level that all of the Utah universities are built onto, and then due to climatic changes going into the dry parts of the, of the, the Holocene, you know, we moved into the Great Salt Lake stages. Now, this part of the hydrograph is drawn in here with curves, but I've been reminded that this is not well constrained. We don't know a lot about this part of the hydrograph, 
And that is in part what makes it interesting to look at these microbialites because they are basically being exposed at these, these lake levels. And so I'm not going to be refining this hydrograph directly, but my hope is to understand something about how the chemistry of the lake has changed in this part of the history. Okay. All right, so Great Salt Lake microbialite. So a microbialite is this general term that's sort of an accepted term to use for these carbonate deposits that are associated with some sort of microbial activity and microbial construction. So the microbes, the, the consortium of things like cyanobacteria and other primary producers, you know, are involved somehow in either nucleating carbonate or, or triggering the precipitation of that carbonate, and they grow in these environments. If they have a nice, you know, layered, you know, laminated look to them, we call them stromatolites. Um, if they don't, they have some other sort of texture, we call them thrombolites. But the over-encompassing term we use for these is microbialites. And Great Salt Lake has a lot of them. A lot of them, you know, all around the whole perimeter of the lake. In green here is, is where these um, are found. Uh, there's, you know, in the past, there's quotations like, it's the largest, you know, modern extent of microbialites on Earth. But of course, that would suggest that these are all actively growing microbialites, that they're, I won't say alive, that they're, they're yeah, I guess I could say they're alive. They're alive. They, we look at them now, they've got some stuff on them, some, some biomass that's growing on them, some paraphyton of some sort. But is that actually the consortium of organisms responsible for their growth? And were these all just sort of modern day things that we see, or they have a longer history? Um, there's all kinds of sizes and morphologies. Um, Mike has, has shown me many locations around the lake, and he is really the expert on where to find these things and understand what they look like. Um, here's one that's you know, fairly, fairly well lithified, that's exposed on the meter scale. There's some that are much smaller, much poor, more poorly lithified. Um, there's some that, you know, the, the longshore wave action gives you sort of these linear, linear features. Mike has found some up to, I, say, I would say, like three meters in diameter. So they can be quite large. Um, and you can, you know, see them in Google Earth imagery. Um, they're associated with all kinds of interesting features around the lake. And so it is really an interesting spot to, to work. So why should we study these? Um, well, from my point of view, perhaps these are a proxy for lake biogeochemical and hydrological changes through time. I'm not the nearly the first person to say this. People have been looking at these types of deposits for literally decades throughout the world, just not at Great Salt Lake, because they've been underwater. You know, so that has inhibited us being able to look at them. Um, modern Anichin Lake. So here's, you know, you've seen Green River Formation microbialites, kind of a classic example where folks have worked on understanding the geochemistry of that lake through time through looking at these deposits. Of course, microbialites are an excellent um, reservoir for petroleum. Some of the world's largest, you know, modern in new uh, finds have been in um, marine microbialites. And so it calls into question, how do they grow? How do they preserve this porosity? Is it primary? Is it secondary? So there's, there's reasons to study these for, for analogs, for exploring for hydrocarbons. And then astrobiology. Stromatolites, you know, are some of the earliest sort of you know, more complicated microbial communities on Earth. You know, we can push these back three plus billion years, maybe three and a half billion years. We see things that look like these in the fossil record. And so it's a way to sort of understand life on Earth. And also if you're going to say Mars and you have a rover driving around or some sort of drone and you're taking imagery and you can start imaging things that look like this, they may be biosignatures. They may or may not be biological, but it's a hint of where you might look. So. So this is, their, NASA is interested in, NASA has been out to Great Salt Lake recently to, to look at, you know, these types of things. Okay, so open research questions. Um, does microbialite carbonate and the organic matter that's trapped inside of these as they grow give us a record of lake composition and biogeochemical cycling, All right? So meaning, you know, are these things primary, do they give us a primary record or have they been changed? You know, because if like anything geologically, if they've been altered considerably, then maybe the signal we're looking at is not primary. And this leads us to understanding how old are these? You know, are they modern? If they're ancient, how ancient are they? When do they grow? Are they growing today? How do they grow? 
these are things that we don't necessarily understand, especially at Great Salt Lake. And so I'm just going to be touching on some of these things, not all of these things. Okay, so my approach, um, of course, rooted in going out and doing field work and understanding where these are, you know, and sampling these, is to use stable isotope geochemistry coupled with some geochronology to look at these and understand, are they preserving a record of the lake? And if they are, what can we say? You know, again, here's work from the 80s in Kenya on a, you know, a carbonate type lake with microbialites growing. And this is, you don't pay attention to the scale, but these are carbon and oxygen stable isotopes. And you note that they are varying together. They are co-varying through time, right? So that suggests to an isotope geochemist that something is going on that is affecting both isotope systems together. And so that might be tracking something in that lake that we can understand. We might be able to use that as a proxy for the composition of the water or some process, including like transgressions and regressions will change the water chemistry. What is the source of water coming into the lake and helping these things grow? Is it lake water? Is it groundwater? Um, stuff I won't get into in detail today, but nutrient cycling, you know, the consortium of organisms that's living in the lake, are they fixing nitrogen? Or are they somewhere else in the nitrogen cycle? We have, you know, evidence for big boosts in primary production, like we see in some places like Utah Lake, right, where we get these algal blooms and then you have die-offs. Do we have evidence for stuff like that uh, being preserved in these? <clears throat> and then geochronology on these can be a challenge, right? So we're dealing with carbonates in a carbonate lake. So right away, anybody who's works with radiocarbon is thinking, well, there might be a problem there. We might have something called a reservoir effect where we have long residence time dead carbon in there that's affecting our ratios. Or perhaps we don't. Perhaps the residence time of carbon is short enough at certain times that those ages are okay. But how do you figure that out? Well, one way is to date multiple things, you know, to double or triple date to see if you get consistent ages. Um, I'm working on this approach, right? Today, I'll only show you some ages from organic matter and these things. Okay. All right, so study locations. So again, um, they're located all around the lake and Mike is working in many, many locations. I've been to a few of these and I have samples and data from where the stars are. Um, today, I'll be primarily presenting data from some microbialites here at Buffalo Point and Antelope Island. Um, I have a lakeside sample from, from Mike that I've done a little bit of work on and we also have one from the north arm. All right, so these come in all shapes and sizes. And I did mention a little bit the definition of microbialite and then stromatolite versus thrombolite. So here we've, I've, I've seg sectioned a number of different ones. And if it was a true stromatolite, you would see this beautiful sort of concentric lamination that really looks like tree rings or it looks like a stalactite when you cut it in half and you see these nice bands. Most of these don't show much of that. You know, you see some, like here, and this is one from the north arm, you see, you know, some of this sort of banding here. This has a really coarse, if you kind of squint at it, you know, there's kind of a coarse banding to it. This one here has this sort of punky, porous core, and then you have some denser stuff with a little bit of banding around it. So these, these, this kind of stuff here, we call it a clotted texture or a thrombolite, you know, for clots. And so there's these sort of carbonate cement clots that are in there and then a lot of porosity. And these things have, you know, I mean, it's carbonate that's growing. So it's trapping and binding anything that's there, All right? So there might be the primary carbonate that's actually gluing things together, but then the lake is full of pellets from brine shrimp. There's, there's brine fly casings, there's lithic fragments, you know, there's ooids, and all of those types of things are getting incorporated into this, all right? So when you go in and decide that you're gonna subsample or work on it, you have all of those things there and you have to be smart about, you know, if you have a student that you say, here's a Dremel tool, go sample this, you need to train them on what they need to go in and subsample, otherwise you can get, you know, a piece of Cambrian limestone, you know, which is not gonna be what you wanna measure, right? So um, back one, that's okay. I'm gonna bring this up, this is foreshadowing. Um, there's also, you know, some things that show these finely laminated carbonates kind of swirling through here around this other stuff. 
I'll bring that up later. Um, these here, the reason I show them it, it, is this carbonate, this laminated carbonate, it's not kind of encompassing something like it was like an outer growth rim. It's actually cross-cutting it. It's coming up through them. So it looks like there's channels of fluid moving up through some of these, and then there's lamin tightly laminated carbonates associated with those. So that's something we're kind of interested in, is what is that, what's causing that morphology, and is it a hint for how these are, are growing? Okay, now you can go. Zooming in a little bit, I mentioned that it's important to know what you're sampling, and we want to understand whether or not the uh, isotope signals that we get are, are primary or secondary. And so we have to go in and do, you know, SEM work, um, you know, just observation work, thin section work to see if you've precipitated new stuff, if you've dissolved stuff out, is it made of something you shouldn't be sampling at all? So here's, uh, you know, sort of two millimeter sort of thin section scale and then uh, SE image on a scanning electron microscope um, of some part of this microbialite over here. And we see we have all these sort of acicular aragonite grains that are all tightly grown in there. You also see these weird, I don't know quite how to describe them, but they're, you know, they're submicron scale, little bulbous mats of carbonate. It's all carbonate, you know? And so that almost gives you the impression, some people would say, oh, that looks biogenic. I don't know. Um, but, you know, you're getting these little microspheres, nanospheres of carbonate that are growing in here. So I look at a texture like this. It's pretty, you know, indicative of something that hasn't seen a whole lot of like dis dissolution and secondary precipitation of something else. Um, so if I can sample areas like this, I'm going to get, you know, better data than other locations like the next slide. So there's also a lot of this stuff here, which is poop, right? So these are brine shrimp uh, pellets. And this is a pellet here, the pellet core. And this is, again, an SC image. And the edge of it, it has these fine little laminations. So there's kind of this carbonate encrustation of the pellets. So they're getting trapped in these microbialites and then they're getting coated in carbonate, right? Um, but if you were to go in and basically sample a whole lot of this stuff, yeah, you're probably going to get this carbonate signal, but we don't really know when it formed. Um, and then the organic matter is going to be telling you something about the brine shrimp poop, not necessarily about the microbes that are living in there. So you got to be careful on these things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I am going to present some data and it's going to be stable isotope data. So here's just a kind of a quick primer on what this means. All right, so all of the numbers I show are going to use standard, what we say delta notation, right? So we would say this is the delta 13C. And so what that is, is it's related to the way we measure the isotopes, the reason this exists. It's much, much easier and more precise to measure isotope ratios than absolute isotope abundances. So we don't collect carbon-13 in a cup and carbon-12 in a cup and then get the ratio. We, me we measure you know, compounds with a certain signal and a certain ratio of carbon-13 and carbon-12 to a standard. So this is all basically measured relative to a standard. That way we can compare it internationally from lab to lab around the world. And so this all kind of came out of the early 50s when this this technique came about, and now we have these international standards that everybody uses. And the, and the standard is that we you know, ratio the common, I mean the heavy, rare, to the common. So for carbon, like 1% of carbon 13, 1% of carbon is 13, and 98.9 .9 is 12. And so that we do that ratio to a standard, we multiply it times 1,000, so it's a nice round number, and then it's in per mil notation. Note that carbon-14 isn't here. These are stable isotopes, so we're not considering radiogenic carbon in this case. Um, other ones that we'll talk about here are delta um, deuterium and then delta-18-0. All right, so the plots I show for these will be, you know, delta-18-0 and delta-13-C in per mil. These are relative to PDB. And so what do these numbers mean? Before we even talk about anything here, what do these numbers mean? Again, they are relative to an international standard. They're useful for comparison from place to place to place. So if we go out and we measure, say, oh, you know, average limestone, we measure organic matter, we measure CO2 coming from the mantle, we measure all these different things, we can get signatures. They can be used as fingerprinting, as tracers, so we can understand where things are coming from, or processes. We can mix one water with another water, 
and we're going to get isotope mixing. We could have hydration, we could have degassing, we could have kinetic processes, these process, biological processes that change, systematically change those isotopes. So that's why we use these. They're, they're numbers that, you know, intrinsically don't mean anything because they're just ratios. What we want to do is compare them to other known ratios from other things and then see what kind of patterns we have. And that's how we use them. So here are two microbialite samples, Antelope Island and Lakeside. Um, Delta 18 O versus Delta 13 C. The, the red and the, the blue dots are just giving you an idea of kind of where we sampled. It's not exactly where we sampled. And then this is just a scatter plot. So the first thing you see is that the Antelope Island and the Lakeside form slightly different arrays with a positive correlation, right? There are, you know, R squareds are okay, you know, there is a positive correlation there, all right, great. So our job now is going to be, does that mean anything? Is that primary? Um, for, rep for reference, here are OOIDs that are shoaling around, you know, presumably close to modern, you know, whatever that means, along the lake shore. And that's where they form. But they could be older ones that are reworked and rolling around. All right, next slide. So people have worked on this in closed basin lakes. And Great Salt Lake certainly is a closed basin lake. So we should hope that it behaves like one. And Talbot has a nice paper from 1990 where they've looked at carbonate from closed basin lakes all over the world, looking at lake core carbonates, like you drill down and you get nice laminated lake core or you grab microbialites. Great Salt Lake actually is in the legend here, so there's some Great Salt Lake data in there. And they see this positive correlation. And that's because whatever is affecting oxygen isotopes is also affecting the carbon isotopes. So if we think about it in a simplistic way, you have a lake level at a certain level, and we have you know, the mix of hydrologic system you know, delivering groundwater and surface water to that lake, precipitation, and whatever those ratios are. You know, they're representative of what's coming out of the basin. The carbon is representative of what's coming out of the basin and what's being consumed in the lake. And then you go through a period of change. Let's say we fill that lake or we shrink that lake. If we fill that lake, that means things are getting wetter, we're adding water to the system, we're perturbing that balance in that closed basin lake, and likely the water that's coming in is what we call meteoric. So it's from the mountains, it's snow melt, it's rainwater, and in general, those isotope ratios will be lower than whatever's in the lake. So then we would expect that ratio to go down. So we would have a downward trend, those ratios. Corollary to that is the lake is drying up and it's evaporating, which is certainly what we see in Great Salt Lake. When we evaporate, the light isotopes, like oxygen-16, will leave the water preferentially to the heavier isotopes. Heavier isotopes stay behind. So the, num the ratio gets higher and higher and higher in the lake. So if we have a drying period, we'd expect the isotope ratios to get higher. So you might look at a trend like this and suggest that that's what's happening in that system, that we're looking at periods of time when the lake level was relatively higher or relatively lower. That's a simplistic view of that because there's a lot of other things that go into it, but we can kind of work with that. And you can get in, I won't get into it, but you can get into you know, mixing in lakes. Are you, are you in a shallow lake that's overturning a lot and are you stirring up the buried carbon and consuming it? Are you in a, in a seasonal overturn, Merrimixis sort of situation where you have bursts of primary production at certain times of the year that affect your carbon isotopes. So you can learn a lot um, from what's going on in a lake looking at these. Okay. So here's a smattering of data from Great Salt Lake from a variety of different deposits. Um, this array here with the black squares is that Antelope Island microbialite that I already showed. The red one here is the lakeside one. And there's some other data on here, some other carbonates. Uh, microbialites. So you see some with these positive correlations and some they have different slopes, some of them do. But then you also see some that have a negative correlation. And that's very strange. That's very rarely reported in the literature. In fact, you can dig and dig and dig, and it's very difficult to find any explanation for that. Um, so I'm struggling with an explanation. I have an explanation for it, whether or not it's a good one or not, I don't know. Um, but for, for reference, I've kind of put the modern lake water. Now this down here is not the carbonate. This is the modern lake today, or at least over several years. Kind of wet season, dry season, you know, sort of late August, you know, April, you know, different, you get different end members. And you also get this negative correlation. So I'm attributing this to, you know, we're bringing in fresh water. Fresh water brings in 
nutrients in the spring, we get bursts and boosts in primary production in that point in time. That's going to cycle carbon faster. That's going to drive the carbon isotopes up. Meanwhile, the oxygen isotopes are going down because you're bringing in fresh water. That could explain a negative correlation. The other thing that's important about this is we want to evaluate whether or not the deposits that we look at today are precipitating from today's lake water or not. One test is to ask if they're in isotopic equilibrium. There's all these equations that have been empirically determined that you know, are the, basically the oxygen isotope thermometer for carbonate. So if you know the water and you know the carbonate, you can figure out the temperature. All right, so what I can do is I can take the, the known water and the measured temperatures and say, well, this light blue parallelogram <clears throat> is the carbonate that would precipitate in equilibrium with that. And you'd say, okay, well, some of the carbonates look like they could be from the modern lake water. The ooids, for example. But then there's a lot of stuff that absolutely cannot come from the modern lake water. Right? These really, really high values are far, far out of equilibrium with the current lake water. And the lake's pretty low, right? So this, this suggests that you've had some process in the past that had enriched these isotopes much more. So much longer residence times, it's hard to imagine that you really had more relative evaporation given that the lake is a historic low stands. So this does suggest that we're looking at some snapshot of chemistry at a different time. Next. Um, another way of looking at whether or not, so we show covariation across these, you know, these microbialites and is there any sorts of patterns, right? We mentioned sort of stalactites and tree rings and you expect maybe those things are tracking something that's happening through time. So if we look at through time, if you use the center of the microbialite to the rim as time, from zero to 10 centimeters here, this is what the isotopes look like. So the carbon and oxygen are tracking one another. They should be because we have a pretty strong covariation, except in a few spots here. So it does look like there is some sort of, you know, isotopic stratification in the microbialite which is important because that suggests that it all hasn't been reset by diagenesis. If we had wholesale dissolution and reprecipitation, it would kind of, you would, you would just blend out all that. It would, you, you get homogenization of your ratios eventually. And so we are preserving something through time. And again, from a very simplistic modeling standpoint, very simplistic, you can take those oxygen isotopes and just do a mass balance and say, all right, what do I need to do to the lake volume to get the isotopes to change this much? And to go from minus four per mil to minus 1.5 per mil or minus one per mil, the lake would have to drop by 28% in volume. So the volume of water would have to be 28% lower, or it would have to be 16% higher or 12% lower, depending on how you look at it here, right? So this, you could say this is a way of looking at when the lake got bigger, when the lake got smaller, but it's a simplistic viewpoint. This is a work in progress. There's other stuff that can go on. You could have Lake Bonneville sitting there at a high stand and not fluctuating much for a couple thousand years. And you could also see some trends just because the residence time of certain things in the lake you know, are there, right? It just, it, it's, it's a little more complicated than this, than this shows. But this is some of the stuff you could do with it. Next slide. Now, of course, we'd like to know how old this is, right? So initially I was quite concerned about the reservoir effect and didn't have a lot of money. So we decided that we would extract organic matter from some of these layers. So we go in, drill out a bunch of stuff, dissolve the carbonate away, and basically get just the organic matter and submit that for AMS, right? And so these are the ages that we get in calendar killer years, right? So those of you who have noticed already, that doesn't seem to be a nice time stratigraphy, right? The, the core of this appears to be younger than this layer and then, then it gets younger again. So that's one observation you make, you're like, hmm. And then another one you might make is that this is really from right at the rim of it. So right at the very edge of this, and this is the organic matter from this, that at least in its current form, you know, this hasn't grown much in seven and a half thousand years. So since the Alta Thermal, this particular microbialite has been occupied by, you know, some sort of shrub-like stuff over and over again whenever it's wet. But it doesn't appear that it's grown in terms 
of carbonate precipitation in a significant way at all that we can determine, at least from this. So that's, that's an interesting observation as well. I can try to argue away these, which is difficult. Um, but I will say that we're, we've got the carbonate out for dating right now, and we're also doing some uranium thorium dating on these. So we'll have three independent ways of looking at the age of these. We can help then arm wave a little bit better. One, one argument is, is that the, the center of this is pretty porous, and this is pretty tight stuff. You go out there and you, you know, kind of pry one of these up or reach kind of down inside of one of these microbialites, you'll note that there's, there's fluid upwelling inside of these, and you break them open, and some of them give you this nice sort of sulfury smell. So you know that there's some microbial activity going on. And so the, the primary organic matter that the microbialites would be encasing is from photosynthesis is primary production. But that rotten egg smell is telling you that there's anaerobic stuff going on. You've got some heterotrophic stuff going on. So you have later microbial activity that's ongoing. So it's quite possible that these are mixed ages. But you got old carbon and young carbon mixed together and you have no way of figuring out what's what. We'll test that hypothesis. Okay. So anyway, they're old, um, older than we thought. Uh, this is a compilation of, you know, the dates I have. Here's some published stuff, the purple dots. The problem with the purple dots is I don't know what this, these researchers did. I know that they're carbonate ages, but I don't know if they're a, a rim of a carbonate or if they took a whole microbialite and kind of crushed it up. They could be mixed ages. I'm not really sure, but theirs overlap a little bit with, with ours. And they do have some that are, you know, only a few thousand years old. But note that at least in this sampling set, we're not seeing anything really, really young. Here's the lakeside one. This is not my age dating. These are, these are older published ages. Um, they have ages from both the organic matter and the carbonate on these. So it's a double date for that. Um, puts it around 15-ish. Of course, it doesn't match up well with this hydrograph. That doesn't mean the hydrograph is wrong. Um, it just means that this, this age might be a little problematic, but there are some that at least go back maybe 15,000 years. Okay, so that's what, you know, the Great Salt Lake microbialite isotope geochemistry tells us. But we shouldn't look at this in a vacuum because there's been quite a bit of other work done on Great Salt Lake and the Bonneville Basin, both in terms of lake cores. Well, lake cores are kind of the traditional way of looking at paleolimnology. Like we go out, we put in a sediment core, we pull that out. We find an age model, way to date the different layers, figure out how, how long it took to deposit those. And then we can go in and do all kinds of different chemical things, including carbon and oxygen isotopes on the carbonates. So that's been done at um, some shallow borings in Great Salt Lake itself. And then way out here, there's the Blue Lake Marsh core that was on the, really on the western edge of where Lake Bonneville is. And then there's also some caves, Cathedral and Craner's Caves. They have some lake carbonates are precipitated in the cave when the lake level is that high. And so those were dated and there's isotope data for that. So that's all smattered on here and color coded. Um, first takeaway you have is everything is giving you this, most everything is giving you this positive covariation, positive correlation, which it should, because we have a, a closed basin lake. Even when Lake Bonneville existed, it was still, the, it was a closed basin. It wasn't draining out. It wasn't, water wasn't coming in and going out, right? It was coming in and, staying in there and fluctuating. Um, there is some data that sort of falls off that. There is um, one of these negative trends in there in one of the lake carbonates, which is interesting. I um, mean, down here I have this sort of hydrograph with some color bars on here that are coded to these different colors up here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show one graph that is pre-flood and one graph that is post-flood, just as a, a bit of an arbitrary way to look at two state, you know, two snapshots, long snapshots of the lake. So this, so there's, here's pre-flood, all right? So pre-17.2 thousand years or 17.4 thousand years ago. And that's looking at these records here. So we have Blue Lake Marsh core from the western side of Lake Bonneville. We have these caves and we have this green line, which is this compilation of sediment cores from Great Salt Lake. This, is, this record here, the isotope data is good, but I don't have good age data from that. It's basically from about 30,000 years to modern, but I have no idea what goes with what. So I'm just putting the whole record on there. This is sort of a great salt rate record that probably is 
pre and post flood. But you see a nice positive correlation, Lake Bonneville time. Um, some things to look at, it's like, all right, my oxygen isotopes are minus 10 to minus six. So that says something about the hydrologic system. That's something about the water that's coming into the system. These are the cave deposits. Um, they both show the same uh, slope and the same oxygen isotopes, slightly different carbon. That's because one set of them is aragonite and one set of them is calcite. And there's just a different fractionation factor for carbon for those. They're essentially giving you the same story. It has a slightly lower slope and you're a slightly more enriched than this um, Blue Lake Marsh um, core. All right, this step forward. Okay, then when we go post-flood, what we see is that records start to deviate. All right, so we have this nice sort of story. And now we're starting to see, you know, out at Blue Lake Marsh, we have, you know, for a while we have kind of the same trend and then it, then it steps out this way. And then it just goes to noise. So what happens there is Lake Bonneville is shrinking and eventually it becomes it's no longer a lake and it's just sort of this wetland. And now we're no longer getting any covariability in those. You're just getting noise in that carbonate record. There's different things affecting the carbon that are affecting the oxygen. So you see the Western part of it hydrologically being separated and then becoming not a lake. And then Great Salt Lake um, forms and you get these isotopes that are stepped out over here much more, to use a jargon term, enriched or heavy as we get this evaporative lake um, in, the, in the Holocene. So this, this just snapshot of a few data sets shows that as maybe as we would expect, as these big pluvial lakes shrink, they become you know, sort of segmented, isolated subbasins, and that those are then going to evolve somewhat chemically distinctly from one another. And we know this from classic work done on Great Basin lakes, that you can start with very subtly different water chemistries and then evolve to very like mono lake versus Great Salt Lake, for example. Very different in members of chemistry, but we all started with some big pluvial lake at some point in time. So I think this is pretty interesting. All right, Lex. And just a little bit to leave, kind of start closing this up, is to kind of come back to this sort of problematic question that we have. I've just interpreted a bunch of stuff that assumes that these things are recording something about lake chemistry. Well, we still don't know exactly how they form. So this is from my you know, intro geochemistry stuff, right? Here's just a, an equation you can write for the precipitation and or dissolution of calcite, right? So if we're gonna think about equilibrium chemistry, we can perturb this. And you know, there's no biological thing in this yet, but biology can affect some of those parameters. If we look at the current lake water and just kind of do some modeling to it, it's undersaturated with respect to calcite. So, it's not gonna precipitate carbonate readily. It's just not. Carbon is cycling through that lake pretty fast, which I think is important for considering the reservoir effect. It may not be that large because the CO2 that's dissolving in is rapidly cycling through that system. So we're not building up a lot of bicarbonate in this lake. Photosynthesis, when forming, you know, if you have a, a cyanobacteria consortium of microbes, if they're photosynthesizing, they can alter that local geochemistry to favor calcite precipitation. If they're using the inorganic carbon or the CO2 to make biomass, they're going to basically take this out. And if you remember Le Chatelier's principle and your little teeter-totter, if you move that, you need to go that direction to balance that out. And you're gonna, you may precipitate carbonate. That would also affect the local pH. That would be a little local story, local risk just around where that activity is going on. There's also the possibility that the microbes themselves are actively precipitating uh, participating in the, in the precipitation, say that, of the carbonate within their cellular structure. This is stuff I don't understand, but Bonnie's here and she can tell us about this. And of course, we don't know which microbes necessarily do this and, and we're not sure when this happens because the age of some of these suggests that this hasn't happened in a while. Another possibility is since the, you know, this is under saturated with respect to calcite, we could also add calcium or add bicarbonate to that water chemistry. You could just take a beaker of it and start adding calcium in solution. Eventually you could precipitate calcite. So perhaps that's coming in from groundwater, which was the next slide. So again, we're back to this laminated carbonate structures that we see in a lot of these microbialites that are vertical or subvertical. And then here's that ladyfinger point. There's a microbialite at the surface and there's a spring. 
that's there. The water is fresher than the lake. It's really salty, but it's about half as salty as the lake. And it, its isotopes are way different than the lake. So that spring water there on a standard meteoric water plot of hydrogen isotopes against oxygen isotopes, the blue line and the green line is what all of your rain and surface and shallow groundwater should look like, you know, worldwide. And so we're plotting right on what our local meteoric water line what would look like. So if you looked at Bear River water, or drainage coming out of the Wasatch, it would probably be around here somewhere. So that spring water that's coming up through this microbialite that's half as salty as the lake is primarily meteoric water. Our colleague Carrie France has put in a bunch of shallow, just like meter deep, shallow piezometer type wells, you know, out at um, Lady Finger Point area, uh, Antelope Island. And this is groundwater, but it falls on a mixing trend between lake water. This is lake water measurements I've made. And so you could suggest that this groundwater is a mixture of lake water and other deeper groundwater. This is not shocking news, but it suggests that, you know, near the shore of the lake, you have two of these, both of these systems existing. And so perhaps there is something to the hypothesis that upwelling waters is contributing to the formation of these microbialites. Next slide. And there are some features out there that are truly looking like they're spring type carbonates. Mike took me to this one out of near Buffalo Point, which is this sort of big tower of carbonate that's got some stuff that looks like microbialite and it's got some stuff that just looks like a tufa tower and it's got some laminated carbonate here around the base of it. And these are reminiscent of what they see at the big Soda Lake, Nevada, these one to three meter tall tufa towers that are forming, you know, due to basically fracture controlled spring water upwelling in the lake. So this is a possible analog for how something like that would form. So just to close it, um, we think there's periodic microbialite growth through the Holocene, the latest Pleistocene through the Holocene, that may provide an additional proxy for Great Salt Lake, meaning a proxy for what the lake chemistry was doing and maybe something about the lake hydrogeology. Not so much for the hydrograph. These aren't informing how, you know, exactly how high or low the lake was, but it's saying something about the freshness or the saltiness of the water. Um, the CNO stable isotope values that we see and some of these are likely primary. I have some new data for some that I didn't show today that look like they may not be. So there's definitely a you know, possibility that you are going to mess up some of these. So it's, you got to look at everything with a careful eye. Um, Intramicrobialite isotopic variability may track changes in basin hydrology and lake extent. So in one microbialite, just like a tree ring or a stalactite, you might be preserving a record of what's gone on when that microbialite was underwater. Now, of course, when the lake drops too much, you're not getting that information, right? So you will, you'll have a hiatus of basically nothing happening. And of course, if the lake gets too deep, that's gonna shut off the microbialite, microbial activity, and then maybe switch to some sort of other carbonate precipitation activity. Um, looking more broadly, we think, of course, that the isotope data supports the idea that Bonneville divided into Iso uh, isolated subbasins as things sort of got lower and drier. And we're going to continue to work on this to try to understand um, the linkage between the geochemistry and the geochronology and try to answer some of these questions on how these form so that we can better understand the record. And then I'll just acknowledge um, Antelope Island State Park for permitting um, our sampling and that of my undergraduate student funding from the university in different sources, and then our, my cross could be core facility for helping with imaging these. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Well, Bonnie could help answer that question. I think the answer is probably yes, that you get to a certain salinity and the microbial population that you have is gonna be different than under low salinity conditions. Um, the precipitation of carbonate can be slightly modified by salinity. You know, the activity of water, you know, the, the activity of your solutions geochemically can be subtly changed, but it's not a first order control. There's other things you can look at in these. I didn't do this here, but you can, you know, it's calcium carbonate, so it's calcium and carbonate, but 
when it precipitates from salty water, it takes in appreciable amounts of sodium and other ions into its structure. So you can also go in and dissolve that and analyze essentially the trace elements that are in calcium carbonate. And then you'd have a proxy for salinity. You could look at sodium changes through time in a microbialite, and that would be directly related to the salinity of the lake. I haven't done that yet. Fine. Place to photograph these? Bob, Buffalo Point or Lady Finger Point um, is the closest, easiest walk. So the Lady Finger Park, uh, Lady Finger Point parking lot, you can just walk down, and I think at the current lake level, you'd be able to photograph them no problem. I personally haven't done any quantitative work on that. Um, Mike has looked at, you know, the association of microbialites along with sort of these macro polygons, these desiccation cracks, and those are, some of those are associated with some sort of, some of these lineaments. I have not looked at it, but um, that would be a logical thing to do in terms of where you would have groundwater upwelling, sort of test that idea, but I haven't done that work yet. You certainly could. I mean, I mean, some of them, yeah. Uh, yeah, some of them that are poorly lithified, you know, they're these cow pie structures as they've been described because they're kind of hollow on the inside and once the lake level drops, they kind of collapse on themselves. But as they, you know, sort of dry out, you know, they, they, they lithify and they get a little bit more, you know, encrusted they become more resistant at that point in time. And so you could imagine that they're a little less, you know, subject to weathering at that point in time. Of course, then they could get buried by sediment too. So, you know, you, if your lake level comes up high, you could inundate these things and that could sort of shut off activity. So you would expect in the chronology, if you had a nice detailed chronology, that you should have unconformities. Definitely should have unconformities that would be defined by doing careful you know, geochron work, but that would take a lot of, you know, a lot of work. And the first thing we need to do is understand which system gives us the best idea of what's going on. All of them are pretty old. I mean, in terms of their growth, they actually start at the very latest light and see where the kind of from there. The ones we've looked at so far, the ones that other people have dated so far, all seem to be old. Old, you know, old being Holocene old, um, not geologically old, but they're, it is curious that, you know, all the components seem to be there today for microbial-like growth. My, the, what I've heard from a lot of some of the microbiologists is that the organisms are there that could do this. Um, but there seems to be something going on in terms of either the preservation or the, the magnitude of carbonate precipitation that, that happens today in the lake. That is different than in the past because we're not preserving or, or you know, preserving the last few thousand to seven thousand years but as we date more of these and get more confident we might change that story and maybe there's locations where this is happening we just don't know that yet yeah i was wondering about temperature you think that water 50,000 years ago colder and i know temperature can control absolutely yeah so um when you do any sort of calculations to understand, you know, what your isotopes mean, you need to know something about that because yes, it is, you know, the, both the solubility of carbonate and the fractionation factors are a strong 
function of, of temperature. And of course, carbonate has you know retrograde solubility. So when it's colder, it's more soluble. That's why your hot water heater falls apart. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I don't, yeah, I mean, the temperature in the past, you know, there's certainly going to have been times when it would have been a lot warmer, like the Holocene ultra thermal. Um, yeah, in wetter periods, things would have been on average cooler. Uh, but we do have cold conditions now at times in the lake, right? We have, you know, the water gets down to, you know, 10 C or 8 C or something in the winter. It doesn't freeze, but we have cold conditions now. So we have kind of a full range. Um, what we need to understand is what water and when these things are precipitating, right? Are they precipitating during the warm time? You might hypothesize, well, we need the warmest conditions to favor this. So in midsummer or something is when that's happening. So we need to understand today what's going on. And then we can better arm wave about, you know, in the past. Because we do know that, you know, there's Lake Bonneville shoreline tufas all over the place. So at much higher, much cooler conditions, we were in the swash zone precipitating carbonates and some of them pretty thick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, that was from organic matter. So if I was looking at the organic matter carbon stable isotopes, it would also be a mixed signal. For the carbonate stable isotopes, it's probably a little bit different um, unless you're actually precipitating, you know, more carbonate later. And of course, that would be a mix mixing as well. It's a little easier to evaluate carbonates via thin sections and SEM. You can look at dissolution textures, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of organic matter, it's much more difficult. You know, you're basically extracting, you know, several milligrams of organic matter from quite a bit of carbonate. And you have no idea its origin, at least I don't, by looking at it in the bottom of the beaker. So that's, that's much more difficult. So I think through, again, I think that's why we need to couple, you know, multiple geochron methods with the isotope geochemistry to understand, you know, how robust these values are. Because if they're all mixed, that's a big problem. We can't say a whole lot. Great. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to come up and talk to Dennis after. Thanks, thanks again for coming. No, Dennis. thank you. That was my pleasure. My pleasure. Pause. My pleasure.